You know, uh, just before I got on here, I was thinking in the last 20 episodes, you're the third guest named Brian. So Brian, <laughs> <I'd> so. <laughs> welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing very well. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for agreeing to do this. And, uh, you know, I don't do too many of these in the evening. I'd rather do them in the morning when, you know, cause I'm a little fresher and, uh, appreciate you taking your time, taking time this evening to, to meet with me here. So before we really get into it, what's, uh, what's your elevator speech when you meet somebody in the elevator, what's your elevator speech? I grew up, uh, farming and ranching in Eastern Colorado. I somehow got trapped into going in TV and I've been doing it for 26 years, but my heart and soul and my passion lies with agriculture and it always okay where'd that start well growing up on a ranch <clears throat> you know how that is sometimes there's not a whole lot to do out there when i say i grew up on a ranch in the middle of nowhere it was 30 miles from any town in eastern colorado so i've been to eastern colorado <laughs> it can be pretty remote um but uh you know i i grew up realizing and recognizing that uh agriculture lives and dies with the weather and that was no different on our farm and ranch and i noticed that my dad's demeanor was a little bit better when it rained than it wasn't as necessarily as good when it's in rain so i always was attracted to that and i always wanted to do the best that i could to figure that out uh to basically not just allow farmers and ranchers to just uh throw a dart at the board and whatever happened, happened. So as I got older, I wanted to bring that agriculture and the meteorology together uh, and be able to demonstrate it to farmers and ranchers that it can be of great service to them. And, you know, I, I'm pretty humble when it comes to the fact that weather forecasting is a very humbling business. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And I never pretend to be the smartest guy in the room, but what I uh, have carved out a niche for myself in is that I can take something very complex and make it be meaningful uh, the best I can to farmers and ranchers. That's something that I've, I've really enjoyed doing. I've met a lot of amazing people. And the thing about folks in agriculture, when they find uh, a weather guy or a weather lady that pays attention to them, they are very great. And I appreciate that. You said the uh, weather forecasting is, is humbling. And I understand what you mean, but it, from the other side, a lot of times we're looking at it going, man, it must be nice to have a job where you could only be right like 10% of the time and not get fired. Those jokes are really tired. <laughs> and, and to be fair, anymore, those jokes are really outdated, uh, to be honest, because we've never, we have never been better at weather forecasting. I'm not saying that that is anywhere close to perfect. But I'm saying the tools that we have to forecast, whether it is satellite imagery or computer modeling or soil moisture model or whatever, have never been better. And, and that is something that I think um, really helps us in meteorology be as accurate as we can be. Um, and uh, some of the forecasts that I listened to growing up, you know, you look back at that stuff and there were some very good meteorologists because they were good forecasters. And didn't have nearly the technology that we obviously have now. I would like to take some of those pioneers and give them the tools that we have right now. And it would it would probably blow your mind because they they did the best they could with the stuff that they had to work with. And technology was certainly lacking back then. Right. And I think a lot of the technology that, you know, a lot of those old timers had was observational skill. And, you know, it, a lot of the wives' tales that we hear, you know, there's they're, they're there's some truth to them, or at least there has been in, you know, my limited observation mm -hmm. and, you know, much like you growing up on a ranch you're, or a farm, you, you start to be a very keen observer of the weather and of weather events. And you get really, really sensitive to weather patterns. Um, and you know, the, the comment, you know, about, you know, seeing your dad's mood change that really hits home because it has been powerful dry here i'm i'm in southwest kansas i used to say south central because like i'm literally halfway between colorado and missouri but it's, um, it's definitely the desert southwest kansas right um 
and I'm only about 20 miles from Oklahoma, so I don't get you know, like the bad winters like they do up around Hayes and Plainville and you know those those type areas. Sure. Uh, but it, it's the drought's been getting progressively worse for three years, and you know it, this isn't my first rodeo with drought. I've been through a couple of them before the 10, 11, 12 drought, the 06 drought. Um, you know, there were a couple other times where, you know, it, it got fairly dry and it was kind of worrisome. This is way worse. Like this, this was so much worse than right. anything that I could have planned for. And I'll be honest, like, um, so for those of you out in podcast land, we recorded this a week ago. I intend to release this a week from recording. So that's, it is what it is. Um, back in the middle of April, you know, it just hadn't rained for three and a half, four months. I had to get out of here. I had to go. We, we just had to go down to Southeast Oklahoma and Western, uh, Western Arkansas where it's rained and see some wet country. Yeah. I'd go see something green. You'll go see like an actual river that was running. That was kind of, for sure. That was kind of nice. So as, as a keen observer of the weather and, and watching patterns, that's more what I'm interested in rather than like, yeah, everybody can open up a weather app. Okay. The next two, three days, that's going to be pretty accurate. Well, I'll admit it's really depressing when you look at the, when you look at the forecast and it's like two days out and it's like a 95% chance of rain and you're like, yes. And then 36 hours out, it's like 87%. Yeah. And then 24 hours out, it's 75 and then 12 hours out, it's 50%. You're like, okay, hold up here. <laughs> right. Well, what's going on? And sometimes that same thing can happen in a more, let alone spread on over over three day period of time. So is it really, is it really that a butterfly can flap its wings in Hong Kong and cause a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico? Everything for the most part, as I know you would, you would probably agree is connected in one way, shape or form. However, when we're talking about weather forecasting nowadays, there, there's a couple of things that I take issue with. And a lot of it has been within the business. It's been self-imposed. Okay. And one of those self-imposition is the fact that through the advent of technology and through the advent of phone apps and computer modeling and so on and so forth, a lot of the meteorology uh, business has penned themselves into a corner. Okay. Where you can pick up your phone and say, there is, an, as you said, an 87% chance of rain. We're, we're getting really accurate there to try to say 87%, okay? And I think that that does a great disservice to the to the the users and the consumers of that information because there's nothing that qualifies what that is about to the user when they use it when they use a phone. I loathe phone apps when it comes to weather in that regard because so much of it is simply computer model driven. So when that computer model updates at a particular time, you're going to see wild fluctuations in those rain chances throughout. Again, with nothing being qualified there, especially from a human that can walk you through about what's going on. Say, well, yeah, your rain chances this morning were 95%, but this afternoon they're still 65%. That's pretty good, pretty good shot of rain. And here's where those storms are going to develop. And this is how the event is going to unfold. There's, there's nothing really there in terms of a human to walk somebody through that. And I think that in many cases that not only does the, the consumer of that information a disservice, but it also does the human meteorologists a disservice in that regard too. Um, so that's something that I try to do with a lot of folks is I sit down with them and I tell them, not necessarily in terms of percentages, but here's how things are going to unfold. And if we're dealing with thunderstorms, you know, someone can get four inches over here and two miles down the road, then get two tenths of an inch. And again, the phone app doesn't qualify that kind of I've had seven inches before on a 0% chance day. I, I'd love to throw that one out there, especially yeah. if it's like, oh, there's a 95% chance that it's going to rain. Well, there's a 5% chance that it won't. And <laughs> we've had seven inches on a 0% chance day before. Of course, yeah. Well, I, I actually had written down like, what's the best, you know, what's your favorite 
weather app, but I, I don't know. Do you have one? I don't. I don't have a single one on my phone. And but what I do have, I have a radar app on my phone that I I lean on pretty heavily. And I also have computer model uh, websites bookmarked on my phone or my desktop or whatever I'm using to where I can put that information um, out there to interested in it and I can walk them through that. And and there was there, there were some real times this past spring where I had to do that for a lot of the folks that I work for uh, in agriculture, because as you were saying, through through mid-April, you know, just dry as could be. Well, in the business of longer range forecasting or seasonal forecasting, I was telling my clients back in late 2022 and very early 2023 when they were asking when this pattern was going to break. And I kept telling them, look, you got to be patient. And things are going to start to turn in late April. And May is especially the tell about where this pattern is heading. And it had a lot to do with what I thought the ocean temperatures were going to do. It had a lot to do with I thought what I thought the way the weather pattern was going to evolve, how past history weather patterns like this have evolved and going forward. Um, and it, there were some nights when I was looking at that forecast and, and you just couldn't blink because you could see what was unfolding and it just had to take the time to do that. Um, do you know what it's like going into a beef cattle conference in Canadian Texas and it's rained that morning? As a meteorologist, <laughs> you're walking in there with your chest out and you're like, man, it's probably hard to lose in a room like that. <laughs> it's pretty hard to lose, you know, but though, though there are always losers in these patterns too. And we've seen that across some parts of the plains that somebody has six inches of rain, you go 10 miles over here and maybe they've only had an inch, inch and a half. That's very frustrating to farmers and ranchers when they see that. So even though the entire pattern has changed and it's unfolded, uh, essentially the way I thought it was going to on that timetable, I know that there are still some folks out there are struggling. And to your point, with this drought, um, you know, there, it, it takes a while to cure that. There's no, there's no way around that, just the way things work from a soil moisture standpoint to a vegetative standpoint to, you know, simply just getting your animals back on track in terms of forage. So I know it's, well, things are are much better right now. Um, we're never very far away from drought. I know two things about drought. Number one, this drought will end. And number two, there will be another one. I could... Those are the two facts that work in 100% situations mm -hmm. about drought. Absolutely. So, I was listening to you talk and... You know, like, like everybody else in the plains have been watching this weather pattern and just wondering when it was going to break. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of have a secret weapon. I go to the climate prediction center. Like that's one of my bookmarks every day. And, mm -hmm. you know, as part of the climate prediction center, they always put out the, uh, what do they call it? Pacific sea surface temperature outlook. And I, I do remember them saying kind of late fourth quarter last year that they were looking that they were hoping that the El Nino would shift to a La Nina sometime late spring vice versa right yeah yeah from La Nina to El Nino right I'm sorry I had yeah. that I get them mixed up every once in a while I knew what you meant okay uh, so, so then we like, we shifted into January and February, and then they started kind of moving that to the right a little bit. They started moving it down into April. And I suppose by the time we got into April or by the time we got into March, they were kind of like, okay, maybe, maybe like first of May. So I've kind of understood that relief has been coming. And, you know, as, like I said, as we record this, uh, we record this a week ago from release date. We've had some moisture lately. I mean, it was a nice, cool, cloudy day today. Maybe, yep. maybe picked up 10 or 15 hundreds. Definitely helped. Soil will soak it up. Um, but in the last two weeks, we've gotten an inch and a half. And I think that puts us at uh, a little over four inches total since the first of the year, which, if I'm honest, four inches is horrible <laughs> for, for the last, you know, hundred or so days. Yeah. Uh, ideally during uh, April, May and June, 
which would be my three critical months to catch rain to to grow forage on the ranch. Right. I like to average 35 years of rainfall data my dad has has collected. Average rainfall for his location would be like right at 10 inches. It's like 9.9 and some change. Highest in that 90 day period would be 16.8. The lowest was five. I bet you can tell me what year that, no, no, I'm sorry. The lowest was not five. The lowest was 2.4 and the second lowest was five inches in that, in that 30 day, in that 90 day period. 90 day period. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been looking at those numbers and been studying that for the last couple of months and just thinking, gosh, can I make a living on two and a half inches of rain in this period? Can I make it on five? Right. You know? And I kind of ran some worst case scenario numbers and, um, I hope I at least get another inch of rain in the next five weeks. Uh, cause I've, I've planned on, I've planned on roughly five inches of rain and I have a really good idea how much forage that's going to grow. Right. And then, you know, if you know that, then it's pretty easy to figure out, you know, if your cows are going to have grass or not. So the Pacific ocean current, let's talk about it. It, that's what really drives a lot of our weather patterns in North America, isn't it? Well, both, both the oceans, both the Atlantic and the Pacific are very instrumental in what's going on in North America. I think, I think there is way too much stock put into what El Nino or La Nina in particular, in their essence, control. Okay. And I think this is especially true with, uh, when you talk about El Nino or La Nina, because Rarely are the, are two of them ever alike. Okay. So I think the variability that's there, uh, you know, works in certain parts of the country better than others. All right. But to give you a good example of that, this, uh, this last leg of this past La Nina episode that spanned almost three years, uh, you look at the state of California and about eight times out of 10, La Nina is a dry signal for that state. And this winter was anything but dry for California. The amount of snow that they had out there was, was pretty amazing. And so I think we have to be careful by simply just saying X is going to mean Y when we talk about El Nino or London. There are other influences at play. And while I was banking on the La La Nina going away and the transition to a warmer and so region along the equator of the Pacific Ocean, the real tell to me was what was going to happen with the North Pacific. Okay, we have a, a decadal oscillation in the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic. So, so go ahead. Explain that term like I'm five. Yes. So when you talk about a decadal oscillation, it flips phases over a period of decades. Okay. Oh. So with the Pacific decadal oscillation, it fluctuates between cold and warm phases on the order of about every 25 to 35 years. The okay. Atlantic has a multi-decadal oscillation as well, known as the AMO, that fluctuates on the order of about every 30 to 40 years. Okay, So you have the PDO in the Pacific, and you have the AMO in the Atlantic, the Pacific decadal oscillation and the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. And when these oscillations change or fluctuate, the influence that they have on not just North American weather, but weather around the world is, is huge. So <clears throat> give you a little bit of background here. About 20 or so years ago, when I really started delving into this long range stuff for my, my family, uh, I started picking up some, some pattern and chaos, if you will. Whenever the Pacific was in a negative or cold PDO period, we were really dry in the western high plains in the southwest part of the world. And you can go back throughout history and see these periods of drought that last uh, when the PDO was in that cold or negative phase. So I started talking to my dad about this, and I'm like, look, you're, you're going to have to start planning ahead for drought and not just one drought, and then you have three good years, but we're talking like perhaps multi-year type of drought that maybe you haven't seen in your ranching life. And, uh, you know, 
growing up in eastern in eastern Colorado or western Kansas or south of Texas and Oklahoma, you know, the, you have the dirty 30s and you have the 1950s. And a lot of people don't realize that the 1950s were worse in scope than the 1930s. It's just when we were better farmers and ranchers in the 50s or in the 30s. Less dirt in the air. Less dirt in the air. Yeah. So I really equate it to what we were going to start going through to what happened in the 50s. And I was showing him some data. I was showing anecdotal accounts from what my grandparents went through in the 50s at that time frame. And what the, they they really needed to prepare for, and and there's one thing that I that I learned growing up in farming and ranching: if you guess, you're going to lose money. If you try to feed yourself out of a drought, you're going to lose money. And I told my dad, and I'm like, look, you've spent X amount of years putting together this great herd of cattle with high genetics, and I'm sad to tell you, you're probably going to have to sell a lot of those cattle before this is all said and done. That's hard to talk to anybody about, let alone talking to your your family about and knowing how dramatically it's going to affect their lives. Oh, I, I've been trying to warn people on social media and been talking about it for literally a year. And that's immediately the pushback. Well, what do I do about my prized cows? I, 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 look, I can't make the decision for you, okay? Buying hay last winter, I'm sure, was extremely painful for a lot of folks. And, you know, if it doesn't, if we don't get a bunch of rain in the plains in the real soon, that feed is not going to come down much at all in costs. Right. And it's going to be another really expensive winter if you guys got to feed hay. Um, so I think, I think in terms of that, when you when you're talking to ranchers about their cattle, and I, I I've said this for years, and I grew up in that way. I'm like, can't be emotional about your animals, and I understand what a hard sell that is to the rancher or the farmer that lives and dies with those animals every single day. But history shows when you are emotional about that stuff. You're going to sell them too. You're going to wait too long to sell and you're going to lose money doing something. And I had that conversation with a bunch of Texas ranchers back in 2010 before that drought down there started. And I'm like, look, you guys are going to have to make some more decisions. They're like, the dams are full and we've had all this rain in the first half of 10. You know what happened in the back half of 10 in Texas? It didn't rain. It was, it, it shut. And a lot of, uh, you know, you go back into 2011 where you have these crazy long lines at the sale bar, you know, cattle trade. And these are things that a lot of people had never seen before. And I think that's what it's trying to, in many cases, it's hard to explain from a weather standpoint. You're trying to get somebody to understand something that they've never had to deal with or have seen. You know, it's normalcy bias is, is what it boils down to. Uh, oh, that'll never happen. That will never happen here. And, and, uh, that's a tough sell, even though you have the evidence to back it up. It's still a tough sell. So to call back to your comment about, you know, how dry it was in the 50s. Yeah. So it was a couple of weeks ago. I, uh, one of my neighbors, we kind of crossed feed routes. So we stopped and, you know, we were just visiting for a few minutes. And I asked him, I said, you know, when did you get to this country? When did you get to this part of the world and start ranching out here? And he said, 1973. And I said, have you ever seen it this bad? And he said, no. And I said, what about uncle Tommy? Cause his uncle Tommy was the gentleman that ran that place before he did. And I said, what about uncle Tommy? And he said that he thought the drought in the fifties was worse. And then I said, all right, how'd you guys have, what'd you guys have to do to feed the cows? And he said that he remembered, either he remembered or he was told that they took a horse-drawn wagon around all the fence lines and gathered up the tumbleweeds to chop up the tumbleweeds to feed to the cows because the tumbleweeds were the only thing that had any protein in them. Right. And, yeah, that was 70 years ago. We didn't have the benefit of modern forecasting. And I... 
I wasn't there, obviously. And then, um, you know, still after, after the forecasting tools that are out there and drought planning, it just kind of, it, it just baffles me that people still get in a position where they don't see a drought coming and they're not prepared for it. But that's part of my paradigm because my dad has always been very interested in drought and weather since he started ranching in the, in the mid to late eighties. Right. And he passed that on to me. One of the, and one of the things that he passed on to me was a drought plan. So, you know, we have our critical dates, you know, started the growing season. Then we have another, you know, that's April 1st. We have, uh, then June 15th. So April 1st, June 15th is our critical time to gather rainfall to grow all of our warm season grass for the rest of the year. Right. So if you don't have X per, you know, X percentage of your normal rainfall from April 1st to June 15th, you destock by Y percentage. Like, you know, and if that's, and it, it's a chart, like if it's this much rain, you destock this percent. If it's this much rain, you destock this percent. Like we're all the way, like I've had to add on new percentages. And <laughs> I kind of had to go to obey your trigger points. Right. Right. Yes. And, that, and that's what I'm getting at. It is, you know, we have, I have, a, have a plan. Like if you don't have the rain by this date, you destock. And more also what helps me spot a drought coming is the November 1st to April 1st rain or precipitation. Right. And maybe that's not always the best and most reliable thing. And I don't know, it, maybe there's a better tool out there, but that's what we've been working on for now. And I'm first time I've said this out loud, I'm actually working on tweaking and retooling that drought plan. Maybe not moving critical dates, but maybe adding some different ones, um, sure. better suit to better suit the operation that I have now versus the operation my dad had when he, when he came up with the drought plan. Hopefully it'll be more applicable to other operations. Yeah. It, it, it's a work in progress it, it, and it kind of has to be, um, really when you're talking about not just weather, but also the markets, what are the markets doing, uh, how, what, what is hay doing? Uh, you know, there are a lot of elements in there that, you know, force you to, to evolve that plan and make it, make it very fluid as you go forward. Yeah, for sure. So let's, uh, let's circle back to talking about what, what's influencing our climate. Now, I, I, what was it? It was probably in the nineties when we first started hearing and people were talking about El Nino and La Nina when it really started getting into the news. I would say I would even go back into the early years. the the El Nino event of eighty two eighty three, uh, and again I remember this growing up as a kid. You know I was I was a nerd, science nerd in there, and we'd get these little weekly readers that would come in, and I remember that weekly reader that I, I, I that I read talking specifically about something that was going on in the Pacific, and that was an El Nino, and then it made me thirsty for more. And this is when. Uh, they really started measuring those sea surface temperatures out there and releasing that information and that narrative to the mainstream. And they were doing it with buoys, okay, back then. And I remember uh, NOAA releasing this massive project. I believe it was called Toga Core. I believe that, that just sticks in my brain. And it was a bunch of buoys being being set out there so they could monitor uh, the sea surface temperatures in the, along the equator and in those ENSO regions. So again, they would see how things fluctuate going forward. I don't think we understood it worth a damn back then, but this is what I remember going back to. It's like, yeah. And then, as you mentioned, accordingly in the, in the nineties, uh, it really started 1997. We had super L need at that point. And then as we got into, uh, the two thousands, uh, you know, it just took off. And then you started hearing more about La Nina. You started hearing about the opposite thing. I took more of an, uh, of an interest in La Nina more than I did El Nino because very early, even before I really went down this, this meteorological road, I saw La Nina hurt the plains more than what El Nino. 
And that to me was interesting because I did a lot of, I did a lot of reading on the Dust Bowl times. And I did a lot of reading on the night, the droughts of the 1950s, specifically anecdotal evidence and accounts of West Texas, uh, Western Oklahoma, Southwest Kansas, and Southeast Colorado. And when I would read that stuff, I'm like, I've got to know what caused this to happen. And it pointed me in the 50s, like I said, to those La Nina episodes in that cold Pacific going forward. And I know El Nino gets all this. It really does because uh, when someone starts talking about El Nino, it's trending on Twitter, it's in news, it's all over social media, it's everywhere. But uh, for me in my backyard, it's oftentimes more about the damage that La Nina does to us that inevitably we have to recover from. Uh, going forward. Okay. I, I wrote down forensic meteorology. Is that even a thing? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Whether it's a car accident on a sun glare type of a morning or whether we're trying to figure out what caused the droughts of the fifties and what perpetuated this drought, uh, that's still going on right now. So absolutely. Forensic meteorology is a thing. Okay. So. Back to back to the El Nino La Nina thing. Yeah. Much like you, super nerd growing up, ag interested weather, we've covered that. One of my dad's routines was he always watched the weather and it was the weather channel. And I always seem to get more information out of the forecast map showing me where the jet stream is, where the fronts are where the pressure boundaries are and the gradients and how that was going to play out over the next couple of days. Like that almost gave me more information than the guy telling me what the highs and lows were going to be. Like, I don't always care what the high and low is going to be or that, you know, the wind is 20. Like, right. I want to know what the wind is doing throughout the day. I want right. to know how fast it's going to get hot. <laughs> like those right. are the kind of things that are, you know, maybe a little more important to me. Um, but more to the point, like the big picture pattern is so much more important, you know, to those of us in ag versus just the narrow slice that a lot of us are getting now through our phone app or what we're seeing, you know, on the local news station. Right. Okay. So now where I'm going with this is like, you know, we, we talk about La Nina being very destructive and, you know, it can be horribly dry. There's also that about El Nino in the plains that, you know, that's what, that's what my dad says. Oh, El Nino means it's hot and dry. El Nino means it's going to be hot and dry. And I can kind of agree with that, but I've also seen the kind of cool, wet side of the El Nino. And what I remember happening is if we have an El Nino and the jet stream comes down to the west of it, Okay, it comes down to the west. I mean, then it has that big bow to the south before it, you know, goes off to the east. If I'm north and east of that, I'm in the wet area. But right. if, but if the jet stream comes down to the east of me, I'm probably stuck in the dry cycle for quite a while until that jet stream decides to move. No matter what, yes, the Pacific Ocean Current's doing. That's right. And the cool thing to your point about El Nino is uh, uh, with La Nina. You usually have one storm track. You have one jet stream. Okay. With El Nino, the pressure patterns flow weaken enough. And also you develop a southern branch of the jet stream that's known as the subtropical jet stream. And one of the big reasons why we have been seeing uh, rounds of showers and thunderstorms in West Texas, southern Colorado, southwest Kansas, Oklahoma is that southern branch of the jet stream has been active. And that is owing to the fact that we are seeing the uh, those ENSO regions, if you will, warm up. And it is helping facilitate that southern branch of the jet stream. So in, in a La Nina, the thing that makes La Nina so crippling a lot of times for us in the plains is uh, that storm track does not favor us around here. We are all usually on the windy and dry side of that particular storm track. You're active in the Pacific Northwest. You're active in the Northern Plains. You drop down to the Corn Belt, the Ohio Valley. They have a great time there. But boy, Texas through northward through southern Nebraska, back to the Southwest, 
really struggles because they're underneath the ridge in that jet stream. And to get to break that pattern becomes very difficult. Uh, so La Nina favors us in that and at least gives us another shot with that southern branch of the jet stream requires it. Okay. Where does that southern jet stream, where does it pull its moisture in from? Usually from the tropical Pacific. Sometimes it can start as far southwest as Hawaii. Uh, it can start off the Baja of California. Right now, we've got one that's running literally from West Texas all the way out to just northeast of Hawaii. So you are you're drawing up some of that tropical moisture. But in many times, especially this time of year, when we start to see the Gulf of Mexico moisture come back to the plains, it's not necessarily about the moisture that's bringing in, but it's the vigorous energy alive that will bring disturbances in and help facilitate uh, repeated rounds of showers and thunderstorms. And that's the pattern right now that has made, uh, I don't want to say all the plains, because that's not the case, but really the western high plains and the southern plains in this in this wetter pattern. That is what has been responsible. Okay, so now that you say that we're in a, quote, wetter pattern, not necessarily a wet enough pattern, but a wet right. pattern. Which didn't take a whole lot to facilitate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you're at the bottom, it doesn't take back. Don't have to have a whole lot of improvement to be much better. That's Uh, right. You know, when you're at ten percent, going to twenty seems great, but when you're at eighty, that you know that ten to that ten up to ninety isn't that much of an improvement. Right. So, what are you? What? Make a guess. Like, tell me it's going to be wet. Tell me what. Tell me. Tell me we're out of the drought cycle and it's going to get better. That's what I really want to hear. But tell me the truth. I, I think it depends on where you are, just like any, you know, I've got, I've got guys in the corn belt right now crying because they haven't had any rain. All right. And it's, it's, it's tough for us in the Western high plains to look at folks in the I states and say, you're in a drought right now. What? It hasn't rained in three days. So you're, you're putting yourself in drought. Okay. I understand they need moisture and they utilize it differently than we need them here in the Western high plains. However, I think there's a lot of folks that have some trepidation about what's going on up in the Corn Belt right now because they think that it should be raining right now. Well, technically for them, what is normal, and maybe it should be raining up there right now, but you got to realize the changes that are on uh, ongoing right now in the Pacific Ocean. We went from a full-blown triple dip La Nina episode all the way now over here to start entertaining the fact that we could have an El Nino be developing uh, during the back half of this year. And I say developing because we are not in an El Nino yet. And that is a wild misconception across a large part of social media. Just because that ocean temperature right now is warm and getting warmer, it has to continue to really connect with the atmosphere and facilitate pattern change. I'm a fan of a warm of a warm Pacific ocean. Cause usually when the Pacific ocean is warm, uh, and I should say warm, warmer than average, we usually don't suffer from moisture here in the plains. Um, and the opposite is usually true. But when I look at this pattern that has developed, we're doing a couple of things. We're keeping repeated rounds of rain in the forecast. We're putting moisture back in the ground. And once that moisture goes back in the ground, that moisture can baked out and thunderstorms during the course of the day. And when I start to see that positive feedback happen, that's when I start to get excited. Okay. So do I think the Corn Belt is going to have this terrible drought in the summer? I don't think it's going to continue. I think the first part of the summer, they may struggle a little bit there. And that's because the pattern is favoring the Western High Plains. And history shows where we are that that pattern eventually starts to move a little bit farther to the east, okay? So those are the things uh, that I'm happiest about when I'm talking about making seasonal forecasts going forward. And, and I'll be honest, my wheelhouse is the Western High Plains. That's that's the region that I really forecast for. Look, uh, we, don't, we don't have to worry about the I-States. Like, most of my listeners are in the Plains anyway. I know, but, but as you said, it's all tied together because right. if that corn that corn crop starts struggling or largely fails, well, how many guys in in the Western High Plains with the moisture that they've had lately have put corn in the ground or are going to? Oh, I don't know. 
you know, it depends on what their sub is, of course, you know, going forward. But I know, I know several people that have been, that have been entertaining that thought and have been trying to make that work as of late. So I think in terms of the pattern, has the drought been broken in the Western High Plains? My gut says yes. Is it going to cure and fix everybody all at once? No, because it rarely ever does. But when I start seeing the weather pattern that is, has unfolded for us in the past, you know, six weeks or so, uh, that is definitely a telltale sign that the pattern is definitely shit. It's hard. It's hard to disagree. Like, I, I want to disagree. <laughs> and then it's going to stay dry. But I don't want it. That's not a hill I even want to try to die on today. But uh, you have to look at the forensics, right? Uh, much like what you were saying today, it was a cloudy and coolish kind of day. It wasn't sunny in 93 with the wind howling out of the southwest. And the more moisture we put in the ground, more vegetation that starts to be replenished, it prohibits, prohibits not the right word. It diminishes that rapid warm up in the morning, that rapid turn on of the wind, which dries everything out. It slows this all thing down and actually starts to reverse that. And when I start seeing that take place, you know, you don't have to live around here very long to figure that out. That things are different. It smells different in the morning. It feels different in the afternoon. Uh, so on and so forth. It's definitely changed. There's no question. Okay. So one of the things that my dad has been saying for the last couple of weeks is that the people that really watch the, the ENSO currents, that they're concerned with the speed of the shift, with the, with the speed of the warming coming out of the triple dip, La Nina, and heading towards an El Nino, the warming. That I think uh, the term was unprecedented. They've never seen it transition this fast before. Um, is does that echo with what you're hearing? And what's your interpretation of that? Well, triple dip La Ninas are very rare. Okay, so in in the history that we call our history, okay, that we know what's been happening. I believe there's only been one or two others. To go off ones. However, when when you do a double or a triple on Enya cut, the majority of the time the atmosphere when it comes out of that will overcorrect the complete opposite way. Okay. And history has shown that. Um, do I think that the way that we have undergone this warming is unprecedented? It has happened in the past this way, but again, not necessarily maybe to that magnitude. Well, so have we seen this transition happen before? Absolutely, we have. When we come out of a, a La Nina episode, we usually will warm things up and go to some sort of. I saw on Twitter the other day, you compared, uh, you were doing a comparison between 2012 and 2023. And if I, if I recall, I mean, I don't want to rustle around papers and grab those rain records, but if I recall, 2012 seemed to be get off to a kind of a slow start and then be a, a really nice, pleasant, wet year on the Western Plains. Well, and, and that depends on where you are too. And the reason, the reason there's a reason 2012 is getting some play on, on social media. And that's because it's dry in the eye states and the forecast for the near term continues to show it be dry in the states. The, the thing that made it dry for them, the eye states is that, the Pacific was cold. It wasn't warming like what we're seeing right now. It was cold. And that North Pacific stayed cold. When that North Pacific is cold, a lot of times it will help facilitate a big old area of high pressure across some part of the midsection of the country, and it makes it difficult to rain. So the thing that I took issue with was you're comparing 2012. Well, the sea surface temperature anomalies and the transition that we're undergoing right now is wildly different from what was happening. In fact, there's no comparison. Now, does that mean that it won't be dry like it was in 2012? Perhaps. We'll see how that pans out. But to look at 2012 sea surface temperature anomalies and say it's going to be just like this, that is, that is erroneous on many different levels. 
Well, I, I grabbed my, my dad's rain records, mm -hmm. 2012. And according to this, it was pretty decently wet early and then it got dry and it was one of the driest 2012 was one of the driest years. Yeah. One of the driest years out of these 30 that I have here looking at. For that reason that I just mentioned, I hope it's not another 2012. <laughs> well, I think the thing is though, is it, it, if you were saying, well, just hypothetically, here, say this summer ended up being dry from where you live at least. Okay. Uh, what facilitate would facilitate the dryness that we could potentially see this year in that area? Was that the same thing that happened back in 2012 that facilitated the same thing? Uh, I think that that's, that's just, that's not, not correct. Um, because in 2012, the Pacific was cold. PDO was very cold. It was not showing any signs of changing. And when that happens, uh, the midsection of the country usually struggles. With that cold period. Yes. Okay. So in April, just this last, this, you know, a month ago, the PDO bottomed out and a pretty negative level. And since then, it has rapidly started to moderate uh, during the month of May. And I think that is one of those things that has helped facilitate this pattern change that we have benefited from the Western Plains uh, going forward. And I think that that's something that people farther east need to look at when they're making a forecast. It's not the same PDO that happened in 2012. We're talking about a really rapidly moderating PDO toward the warmer side of things. Is it going to completely eradicate it? Probably not on their time schedule, but we are in a completely different spot. Than we just even just even about six weeks ago, uh, it's, it's rapidly changed, which for me and the people that I work for in Western Plains, I'm very excited. Because, uh, you know, we, we need, we need some time to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And get some footing. All right. Ready to shift gears a little bit. Yeah. You're yeah. driving the bus here. <laughs> oh, that's rough. Um, so right around 2006, going through another drought. I'd just gotten out of the military and I was moved back to Kansas. And one of the first things I remember is we went to a presentation uh, from a meteorology student at OU. I think the guy's name was Andrew Reeder. Don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, and this was 2006. And my dad asked him like kind of point blank. He said, what, what's your outlook for the climate? And he said that the extremes will be more extreme. The, and the swing, like the transition from extreme to extreme will be faster. Like, and he also said that the period of normal weather that we've had, the period of relatively stable climate is coming to an end and we're expecting more rapid shifts in the future. And I, th when I think back and my human flawed memory of what the weather has been like for the last 16, 17 years versus what I grew up with. Now, granted, you know, I'm looking back at 17 years and the, the quote, the weather we grew up with is really what two or three years, five, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So I think back and I look back and yeah, it does. The weather does seem to be getting wilder. You know, they, they, Wet periods seem to be getting wetter. The dry periods seem to be getting drier. The hot days seem to be getting, you know, hotter. Uh, I remember it wasn't too long ago. Well, maybe it wasn't too long ago. Yeah, 10 years. I think it was probably 10, 12, 10, 11 years ago where we had like 98 days in a row where it was 98 degrees or better. Like, that's just absurd. Yep. And, we, and then we've had summers where it's barely been above 85 too. So... What and climate change, let's just say I'm not a denier. I'm not going to deny that the climate is changing. I'm not and since the beginning of the history. Yeah. Like, like it, it's fallacy to think that we're like just because we've had this little 
little tiny sliver of a window into the history of our world of what the weather has been like that we know what it's always been like there is no freaking way we can make some educated guesses with some forensic meteorology right that's right but you know on the whole we don't know what you know what the weather patterns were like you know even a couple hundred years ago so i I guess what i'm getting at is yes the climate is changing and whether or not man has an influence on it like we undoubtedly do like just us being here moving around has has some sort of influence on the climate whether it's a large is it a large enough to influence the climate over a long period now probably i don't think that's up for debate anymore the question is is what is the climate doing and do we have enough time to do anything about it? You're asking me that. Uh, more rhetorical question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I guess it depends on who you talk to. Um, you know, I didn't live through the 30s. And I didn't live through the 50s. And there were some really extreme type events in the 1970s. and I think, you know, everybody's memory nowadays is only about 15 minutes. And the way we are observing weather, everybody's got it on recording. It's all over social media. These events that are also happening now are more seen than any other events that have ever happened on the planet's history. Okay. As weather on this planet, and especially here in the Western High Plains, I'll just narrow it down to that screen. As weather on the Western High Plains always been extreme, always, and that's never changed. It's you know you talk to somebody about rainfall in the Western High Plains, and they say average. And I always joke, average in the Western High Plains is either way too much or not nearly enough. You divide that number by two, and that's a number you never get. Okay, what's that's your just, normal rainfall like, brother? Normal is a setting on a dryer. That's right. You know, so, and I can remember my grandma telling me, you know, living through the fifties where, uh, in the summer, I forget it was 50, I want to say 54 or five. She said it was just terrible. She said, no grass for the cap. We had to feed them and we had terrible dirt storms. She said, come October, we had a blizzard, put three feet of snow on the ground. And I'm trying to wrap my mind around that to deal with that back in those days when, when they didn't see it coming and you go from that level of extreme to another and have to deal with that. What to me that people would lose their mind today having to go through something like that. And I, and I, I have a colleague that I work with and before this last, this last winter in California, I specifically told him, I'm like, you know what? I said, people are going to lose their minds when it starts raining and snowing. And I said that about the Western High Plains too. And I remember back in 2011 and 12, uh, late 10 through 11 and 12 in Texas, the term perma drought was kicked, was kicked around. And that wasn't the case in 20, late 14 and 15 in Texas, especially 2015. It was, it was some of the wettest times in history now. And so I have a real hard time with absolutes in science because I think that just makes us very arrogant. And I think as scientists, we have to be open to all of these different ideas uh, and see them evolve and unfold. Um, because all you got to do is look back through history and see how things evolve. And see how things have changed. Now, does that mean that we can't have more extreme weather at certain periods of time than we had had before? No, that doesn't mean that at all. It just depends on what is potentially driving that influence going forward. And I don't necessarily know if that is very well understood or not. I am not ready to sign off on that. Um, I've taken some heat for that. But it's also one of those things like, look, I'm not telling you guys what to think. I just haven't had my mind made up just yet about what's going on. But I also know one thing, Brian, and I have seen this evolve uh, 
as as an adult of someone who's watched this very closely, that if you throw money in politics at any, it screws it up seven ways from Sunday. And this messaging of climate change or extreme weather or whatever, the messaging has been terrible throughout. And so much to the point where the average person, they don't know what to believe. And I deal with a lot of folks like that. They don't know what to believe, uh, whether they don't trust the media anymore or they don't trust what they read anymore or wherever they're getting their information. They just don't know what to believe. And I think that that, that is a real problem when it comes to the message. I, I can't disagree. Whenever politics gets involved, oh, you're just a climate denier. Like, look, I'm, I'm so... My views on the climate do not determine my politics, and my politics do not determine my views on the climate. Like, we all live on planet Earth. Let's try to take a little bit better care of it, guys. Like, that, that's all I want to say. Right. So, um, where but, would you... One more thing, though. I'm sorry to interrupt. But Go ahead. You, you also asked the rhetorical question, can we do anything about it? I also think then that narrative has been grossly overstated, that we can do something about it in a meaningful and a reversible way, whatever reversing means, because I'm not necessarily sure people know what that really means. Can we stop the climate from changing? There is no way we can stop this climate from changing because it has done nothing but do that since the beginning of this plan. Right. I mean, so, so when you're trying to sell somebody on that, that just came home from a nine to five is sat down in their chair and have a cold beer. Tell them to wrap their mind what that means when maybe all they did all day was look at the emissions that Russia's putting out, China's putting out, India's putting out, and they're scratching their head thinking, what are we going to do to offset that? Why am I paying a price with inflation on whatever scale or listening to some politician talk about this? You see what I'm saying here? In the common sense realm, it's a really hard sell. In my opinion. Never really looked at it in the way that, you know, we can't stop climate change. Like, no matter what we do, we're not going to stop climate change. It's not a matter of global warming or global cooling or we're going to be in an ice age. The climate's changing. I don't think there's anybody that has any sort of consensus on which way it's going to go, like long term. And, you know, if we don't have any consensus on where the climate's going long term, much less all the forces that are driving it there. You know, there's one side that says, well, we need just need to stop all this human activity. We need to stop, you know, we need to stop farming. We need to stop burning carbon. We need to stop doing this, that, and the other. And the other side says, well, it doesn't matter because it's going to happen anyway. Let's do more and make it go faster. And it, neither one is the answer, obviously. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even proposing that there is an answer. I'm just saying that it's a much more complicated question than, than really can be answered, you know, in an, in a 60 second or a two minute soundbite on the evening news or in an evening news weather forecast, even kind of in a long form podcast, it's difficult to unpack, you know, all, you know, a lot of issues and really see where we're going. And you know, it, it's, I think at the end of the day, it's up to each of us to maybe try to understand our impact on the world and how, what we do and how we choose to consume and how that affects the world on a bigger scale. And how does that relate to weather? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just running my mouth now. Well, I think that, I think that is also a message has been terribly mixed is climate and weather are two different things yes weather is what you get 
climate is what you expect. Okay. Because we're dealing in short term weather, but long term climate. And I think if you point to one specific, you know, I see it on both sides of this debate. I see, oh, we're freezing on March 13th and in the Northern Plains, some global warming that is. That's just a dumb statement. Okay. For, for a whole host of reasons. But I've also seen it on the opposite side of the coin, too. And so you have these two polarizing uh, forces where you're, you're looking at the wrong thing here. You're pointing to a single weather event and relating it to climate. That, that is not right, okay? However, you look over a period of time, okay? For example, we've had more drought none in the western high plains for the past 25 years that's just the way it's been that doesn't mean that we have good years but the average has been more bad years than that. i think that is safe to say i, I would agree 100 percent. Right. now if you're talking to somebody's like well what does that do directly and so when they ask me something like that i go to immediately something i can sink my teeth in well, back in about late 98, 99, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation changed from warm to cold. And since that time, we have seen more La Nina events than El Nino events. And history has shown that when you have a cold or negative PDO, we struggle more times than not in the plains. And that is something that I can show. I have showed that to, I work for a cop farmer in, uh, near Lubbock, Texas. And he was asking me, and I get this question, said, man, we got all these wind turbines around. What type of influence is that having? It's, it's messing up my weather. I said, you know what? I said, let, let me show you a little graph about when the PDO flipped. And he's a, he's a weather nerd to the nth degree. Has to, for what he's, for his business. He, he charts those right. And he said, Man, he said, I can literally point to the time in history when I started noticing us having problems, and it shows up right there on your grant. And I said, these are the things that I think get lost in the, the climate message that rarely ever get talked about because nobody wants to hear about these things. And yet you can directly attribute some of the things that we are seeing happen to some of those types of events. Well, I, I'm a weather nerd, and this is the first time I've heard about the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and that it is heading towards positive and what sort of effect that may or may not have on our weather. Like, right. right. And I do a lot of speaking all over the country to a lot of, and I tailor my stuff mostly to ag and to my ag audiences. And I ask them everywhere I go, how many of you have seen this kind of thing? It is astounding the amount of people that haven't heard. And the amount of times that they grab onto it and they just thirsty for more. Man, I've never seen this. This, this makes sense to me and I can really understand this. Thing. Uh, and the same messages to them the whole time. Most, whenever they hear the term climate change, goes on deaf ears, man. And it is because the way the message has been messed up. But you show somebody 30 years of data on a graph. That's right. They sink their teeth into it. And they, the thing is, it's even better, is that they lived through that. So they, you know, farmers and ranchers, they, they are some of the best meteorologists in the world because they've lived through it. They recognize the pattern. They live and die with weather. And they remember that stuff. And they, they can directly attribute some of those things to some of the things that I can show them. Um, and I think that that's something that's really important. And for me, as I said, I, I don't ever pretend to be the smartest person. There are people that are way smarter than I have done a lot more research. But what I have tried to do with the folks that I work for is take something that's complicated and make it be meaningful to them with zero strings attached economically or political. And I think that that's the type of information and the, uh, the, the way about going to do things 
is sitting down with them and actually having a conversation without anybody screaming at each other. And unfortunately, that's that's where this this whole narrative is going. Okay. Do you think the long-term pattern in the Western Plains is drier or do you think it'll be closer to the quote normal setting on the normal average? I think over what period of time? Um, I guess the historical normal average, what they would, you know, what, what I guess the lay person would say, this is what, this is what the weather does in the Western Plains. Uh, for somebody that was probably a neighbor of mine, they'd say probably like, oh, we get like 26 inches of rain, which stopped pretty far off. Um, do, do you, do you see the pattern, the long-term pattern for the plains getting drier? I think it depends on, on one thing in particular, and that's we've been in a cold or negative PDO for the past 25 years. Now, this oscillation changes on the order of about every 25 to 35 years, depending on, you know, the stuff that you look at through history. And history shows that when the PDO warms up, we don't suffer from moisture much in the middle, such, uh, the middle part of the country. Okay. Now, at that time, and, and you can go back to the 90s, okay? Well, what we had in the 90s was a warm PDO and a cold AMO. And I refer to the 90s, many cases, the golden age of agriculture of Western Africans. Okay? So if you're looking for, for uh, where to put this in, or shoehorn it in, is I think we have to be very careful about what we project because when that Pacific blinks, it, it is meaningful to what type of weather and long-term weather and climate we see here in the Western Plains. However, I also see what's gone on with the Ogallala and the depletion that has taken place with that. Does that have an impact on the Western High Plains climate? I think it does. You suck water out of the ground and you don't put it back in. Inevitably, you're going to have a long-term impact on it. Okay. I, 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 I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't also taking, say, a tenth of a percent of the energy out of the wind have an effect? Oh, it, of course. I mean, it's all going to be, all going to be related. So okay. that's, that's the argument for wind farm. I mean... Yeah, we're, we're extracting energy from the wind. Nature balances her books. Right. Nature balances her books. So that's energy that's not going somewhere else. I'm not saying I know where it came from or where it's going or that it would have been used to power a storm. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that wind turbines capture a percentage of the energy in the air mass, and that has to affect something else somewhere. Let me narrow that down for you. Okay. So what we look at in terms of uh, a wind farm, we're talking about a micro scale there, okay? But around those turbines, okay, and those turbines are spinning at night, they continue to mix the air at the surface. So the air doesn't cool down like it normally would, okay? The air around those wind turbines are staying mixed. Now, if we were to put solid wind, wind turbine and wind, wind farms, from Williston, North Dakota, to El Paso, Texas, would all of that have an impact on what's going to happen with the weather? We'd I think common sense would say absolutely. Okay. But the fact that these wind farms are not continuous and they are micro scale, are they influencing the micro scale weather and climate over a, a short period of, of distance there? I can point directly to that information at night that next to these wind farms that do not cool down like they normally would if there was no air stirring at night so that means the the ground level air stays warmer later or or more through the night correct now what impact does that have on a larger scale i do not know and i don't think really anybody knows. and the thing that is troubling to me is that I haven't been able to find a, a, a study on something like that. Why do you think that is? Because nobody wants to study that. 
and actually uncover the truth because that would be unprofitable for a lot of really, really large corporations. That is the trouble I have in the narrative. On the mall that I you. What's that? You're the right guy to be on this podcast. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm talking to you. I think I think this is a good thing. And it's it's one of those things, Brian, that I see, I don't have a hard time having that conversation with somebody. I can sit across the table with somebody and they can say, I hate you and you're wrong. And I'm like, what we're just having a conversation here. Isn't that in person? And a lot of this messaging and this narrative went off the rails when it became that polarized and it became that personal. And I think it became in such a way that really not, uh, I, I quit caring about it. I was just like, the, the message is, is screwed up. It's messed up. And that message, that horse is out of the bar. That toothpaste is out of the tube. There's no getting that back. Not at this, not at this stage. There just isn't. So my my goal with my with my clients and my audiences and whatever i want to take something that is meaningful to them and show them things that potentially they've never seen before or in this case with pdo you had never heard before and make it be meaningful to them so they can use that information and and be profitable as much as they can anybody in agriculture needs any leg up they can get and and from a weather standpoint, whether it's short-term forecasting or seasonal or whatever, that's really what my goal is. Good stuff. Good stuff. So um, what, what's the Desert Farmer podcast? So several, several, well, I shouldn't say, well, it's been a few years back, okay? Uh, I met a gentleman, Nick Boss, on, on Twitter. Okay? Oh, we've, I, okay? I, I know you know Nick. I, yeah, of course you do. And he would rail against National Weather Service in Dodge City all the time. And I, and I jumped in one day and I said, look, let's pump the brakes on this, all right? You're farming in a desert and you're complaining about not getting any rain. Dude, Nick goes hard. Like, that guy goes hard. I love that he guy. He does. And, and I'm sure he's going to be listening to this, but I have told this story a bunch of times, people. And I said... I'm always going to advocate for the hashtag desert farmers. And it just kind of took off a little bit. And so now we have, we have a meeting in January in liberal Kansas. I organize a meeting in Burlington, Colorado in August. And it's like this. And I don't think I'm wrong in saying this, this cult. Okay. Of all of us chatting about weather that's meaningful in the Western High Plains, because we all recognize what what we're up against here in in trying to make the desert cool. And uh, it's just a good group of people. And I'm one of the weather guys in this. I talk to them a lot. I work for a lot of them. And again, it's it's uh, it's a group that's very near and dear to my heart because of where I grew up and because I know what they're up. And I don't, I say this a lot. I don't pretend to be them. I don't pretend to have their skin in the game. But what I do is just try to give them a measured approach when it comes to weather and what's going to matter to them so they can navigate this the best way. So here in a little while, when I get time, I will be starting the Desert Farmer podcast for the Western and Southern ones for anybody that wants to listen to me right Awesome. And I'm going to have some great guests, and I know you're going to be one of them, too. Well, wait, when do you get down to the bottom of the barrel of BHA? <laughs> but I'm excited about it. I really am. There's so much knowledge with these guys. There's so much history. And, and I think in, in this age that, uh, you know, whether you're dealing with great times on the farm or you're struggling with mental health on the farm, or drought, or whatever's going on, I think, you know, it, it's important to talk about. And I like to be able to try to be that media, whether it's in a serious manner or whether it's in a funny manner or whether it's in a self-deprecating manner, if they want to kick me out at me or whatever, it, it's okay um, because I love the people and it's, it's something I think I'm going to have a lot of fun. Okay. I only have, I just have a couple more questions. Yes, sir. 
So I already asked you what your favorite weather app was and you completely destroyed me on that one. So if a, if a, uh, this, this one's good though, this one's good. Yeah. All right. So if I wanted to invest in a quality weather station to put out on the ranch, is there any you'd recommend looking at or any you'd recommend staying away from or? It depends on how much money you want to spend is really what it boils down to. You can spend uh, a couple hundred bucks and get, uh, you know, one of the more popular ones is the Davis. Okay. Davis weather instruments, uh, I think is a cost effective weather station for you, or you can all the way go up to some really high end stuff, uh, and spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars in some of this. So for me, I know I didn't want to spend all that money. I need to know what the wind is, temperature, uh, the dew point, rain bucket, that type of thing, you know, and I'm, I don't work for Davis instruments. I just know what, what I've come across and what I've used, but. For the money that you get, you know, it, I'm all right. Some people may think that that's not right, but that's, that's just my opinion. Long, long time. We had a Davis weather station out at the ranch mm -hmm. and it failed, uh, partially due to a, you know, a little wildfire incident. Um, and they didn't offer those, they didn't offer that technology anymore. Like you, it was to the point where it had to upgrade, uh, sure. You upgraded to a little bit better model and it only lasted like four years and they wanted to, and then we had, would have had to replace the whole sensor package for like 300 bucks. So I went to a cheaper weather station that lasted a year. I mean, cheap is cheap. So we're probably going to be heading back to, to the Davis weather station. They don't sponsor me either. They just, they just make good gear. Yeah. And they're, and they're widely known. I mean, there's, there's a lot of folks that, that have Davis instruments, whether it's in the city, in the backyard or or out there on the ranch. My folks have one ranch too. And you know, they like it. And and you can get some pretty high end stuff with Davis too, uh, depending on what you want to track and what you want to what type of information. Yeah, like for the real farming nerds, they have like Evo transvaporation and you know, all other kinds of sensors you can put out there. Yeah, exactly. All right. Where can folks find you out on social media if they want to follow you, listen to your forecast, or engage your professional services? I do a lot on Twitter. That is probably uh, Facebook with a lot of the folks that, I, that I've talked to. A lot of people have gone away from Facebook. Twitter for me has been, for better or for worse, whether you like the medium or not, really works for me because folks in ag, for whatever reason, really grab on the Twitter. And, uh, and it's, a great, it's a great communication medium for us to, for us to chat. So it's just simply at Brian Bledsoe. Uh, you know, you can go there and, and check out what I have to yammer on about or whatever, or, or interact with some of the conversations we have with, uh, with some of these desert farmers on there. It's, uh, it's, it's usually a good time and we, we always have fun. So it's, but that's, that's where you can find. Me. All right. Good stuff. Did I leave anything out today. Covered a lot of stuff, man. It was, it was a lot of fun chat. Well, I, I appreciate the message of hope. I have uh, I think I feel a little bit better about the next six months in the Western Plains and being able to grow some grass and make a living. Always been tomorrow country. <laughs> you got to <laughs> Oh, last thing. Yes, sir. Old saying from the Navy. Red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Can you unpack that? I just think that's something they made up. Really? <laughs> I do. <laughs> because I've had conversations with sailors before and they've seen stuff happen completely in the opposite way. But, you know, like anything else, sometimes perception's reality of that. So I'm sure somebody started that along the way. And we've had, uh, we've had seven inches on a 0% chance day. <laughs> But I'll tell you this, that in, and to your point about some of these sayings, the desert farmers really talk about seeing turtles go uphill. That's going to be a rain. And snakes crossing the road. That's going to be a rain. Okay? We got to get that little plug in today. All right. What about 100 days after a fog on the ground at 10 a.m.? I've, I've heard the same thing, too. But I, I've seen a lot of times that, is, that has failed. 
My dad used to talk about the cows bunching up in the corner of the pasture. He said, it's going to rain this afternoon. And I'm like, just swatting flies is all they're doing. <laughs> they're just standing up there because it's the only spot where they can catch a wind. But these, these things started somewhere. And like I said, perception's reality. All right, man. This is a. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate your time and uh, gang. Go get out there and have a great week. Good stuff, brother. Have me back anytime. Yes, sir.